sun, red and enormous, began to sink into the western sky. And simultaneously, the moon began to rise on the other side of the river with its own glorious shade of red. Coming out of the trees like a russet firebird, the sun and the moon seemed to acknowledge each other in dance of light across the oak and palm. Father watched it and I thought he would cry again. He had returned to the sea and his heart was a low country heart. Some kind of seafood. I wasn't always in the shrimp business or the clam business. We were in the eel and catfish business for many years. My dad had a couple of catfish houses. So your dad was, he got you in this business? No, he was a mullet fisherman from Florida come up here in 1952 to catfish. Because mullet was $2 a hundred. And uh, so we left Florida. But we, my family's always been in the seafood business. Do you like it, obviously? I guess so. I don't know how to do anything else. <laughs> yeah. Are you filming me now? No. <laughs> <laughs> he hesitated too long. My father had this business before I did with some another. They were there was it was kind of like a family business. It was a family business. I have a daughter that's a singer, and she's really great, but the rest of the country doesn't know about it yet. But anyway, in the early part of the imports, I was, I said, well, I'll write a song for it. And I forget what it was, but in there it had to do with Shem Creek and how we were losing. At the time, we still had quite a few boats in here, but I... I wrote it and it, it, I had one line in there, or maybe it was near the end, that said, uh, tell the shrimpers they'll have to go, but leave us one boat for show. Still have a vested interest in these guys. Keep up with them. Still talk to the shrimpers on a daily basis. I mean, I did it for 38 years, so even though I don't have any financial roots in it now, it's still, it's in my blood. Well, I've done, I, I went through a period of actually doing pretty well in the 70s and 80s and built some new buildings and expanded things and did a few creative things and had shrimp boats that we owned and uh, my father and I did a lot of that together. He was still, you know, right here until a couple of years ago. And um, so we, we had shrimp boats at one time, we had uh, clam boats at one time. We, we were a lot more into the production side of it than we are now. I'm, but I, I got rid of all the boats, mainly because of insurance problems, or just it got so expensive. And um, now I'm just the, the guy that buys the seafood and tries to market it for the guys the best I can. We think that we wish it was all local, you know, that it was either uh, caught wild or raised locally, uh, rather than brought in from overseas. That's what we wish and what we think about. Uh, and we are um, competing with the supermarket in a broad sense. People that know to come to the docks, it's the competition among each other for um, the right price. But for you know, your man on the street, we're competing with the supermarket. And you know, they have to know where to go for shrimp and how to get it. And you know, so we would like the supermarkets to carry local shrimp too, which some of them do. So. We, we've got a few restaurants that buy, buy our shrimp and, and uh, um, they, they advertise and we've got a few um, um, retailers that buy our product 
and they advertise that it is local. And uh, I wouldn't deal with somebody that would just buy a few of my things so they could advertise that the imports were local. But there are some, there are restaurants that, that, that are really careful. I mean, we've got a couple of them here in town. They will not serve an imported shrimp, so they're good about it. I've actually had that happen with, uh, with oysters, where they would buy a bushel or two of my oysters and then get them from somewhere else and act like they were all my oysters. If they advertise fresh seafood or local seafood, it should be local. And when I say local, it can be from Texas to here. I care less. It's still caught in the United States. But don't say you got local seafood when you buy in uh, Vietnam and China shrimp, you know. And that happens so much because you go in and there's no way to know unless you ask and then maybe or maybe not, you know. I mean, we got some of the best restaurants in the world in Charleston. And uh, the higher end restaurants in Charleston, they're going to get the fresh local shrimp because the chefs, they have quality chefs. And they're not going to deal with uh, uh, an imported shrimp. We sell about the same amount of, money-wise, our business is probably about half oysters and half shrimp. But then on the other end, we started culturing clams on our leases about in 99. And, pro and we figured out last year 51% of our total revenue is from the cultured clams. And we'd probably be, there'd be a condo sitting here right now or a big house if we hadn't had the clams to fall back on. Because the oysters and the shrimp are up and down, up and down. Um, we've had a couple of bad shrimp years when it was the clams in the bank kept us going. And, and then we've had a couple of bad clam years when it was the shrimp that kept us going. So. They've spiraled downward rapidly, like I said. These few guys that are left, they're survivors, and they may survive a while longer, and I hope they survive another 50 years. Um, like I said, the Magwoods will probably be the last man standing because they own their own dock. And one day, this dock, I mean, someone with money could come in and say, we could do a lot more than we could with shrimp trawlers. So they're gone. But as of now, in the economic status we're in in this country right now, nobody's really interested in this property right now. But it could change overnight. And uh, like I said, I still have a, an interest. I keep up with the guys, what they're doing. Uh, go out occasionally with them. I'm pulling for them. I hope they make it. And they, you know, it could it could change. I mean, I think I, I love the industry. I think it's fun. I enjoy. When we go on vacation, I go look at shrimp docks and other places. But um, you know, I, I, nothing, nothing really negative about the the industry. The big thing that's just killing the boats is the fuel cost. I mean, that's the one big thing that they, if they could overcome that is somehow, um, you know, if the fuel was a third of what it is, they'd be, you know, they'd be really making a lot of money. But when you start out in the morning, when you pull away from the dock, you know you're going to spend about seven, eight hundred dollars on fuel before you get back if you spend a full day out there. That's tough. That is tough. It's, you know you've got to put seven, eight hundred dollars worth of product in the hole just to cover that cost. That is, that's, that's the kicker. That's the big difference in the seafood industry today and 30 years ago. That's the big thing. We used to travel up and down the coast, you know. I traveled Campeche, Mexico, all the way to Virginia Line. The, the fuel that you burn catching a shrimp has a direct relationship with what you need to get for those shrimp, you know. And, and like if it was 95, diesel fuel in 95 was probably a dollar and a half a gallon or, or something like that, a dollar a quarter, and now it's almost four dollars, so. Shrimpers are very special people. They have that bond that you couldn't break. You, I mean, we fuss and we fight, but when we get together, I mean, hey buddy, how you doing? You need help? You need a helping hand? You broke down? I'll come and get you. That's the way shrimpers do. I mean, we look out for one another. The Magwood family was one of the two first families in this creek, the Tollers and the Magwoods. And Wayne's daddy was uh, Captain Junior Magwood, who everybody that knew anything about shrimping had heard of Captain Junior Magwood. And uh, Wayne, started running a trawler when he was probably about 14 years old. And he's still, actually he's semi-retired. 
his uh, nephew Rocky Maglid runs the trawler for him. Wayne has a wins a fortune, a 68-foot glass Desco, one of the last new trawlers made in uh, probably made in the late 70s. Desco went out of business in the early 80s, so that's they made more trawlers than anybody, and they went out of business. But uh, Wayne's still hanging in there. He does a lot for the community. Oh yeah, the guys that are left in the industry, the, they are the hard, I mean, determined shrimpers that are left, they're gonna be in it. They're gonna, they, they're gonna stay. I mean, it, it, it really has to re get really, really bad to where everyone just give up. But um, we went through some tough times. We've, in the past 10 years, shrimpers have went through some really, really tough times. So. I just enjoy being a fisherman. And um, right now we're not catching a whole lot of um, shrimp. But when you do catch a lot of shrimp, it's a big rush. And I enjoy it. So that's, that's what it is. Kind of like when Frank was catching swordfish. It's, it is a rush when you catch a lot of swordfish. When you catch a lot of shrimp, it's a rush. How, how vulnerable is your business? My business is just staying alive. I, I, I mean, if I didn't love to do it, would I be in it? No. Would I, would I stay and do this? No. But I love to do it. I mean, I'm not, I'm far from being rich. I'm far from being, having a big bank account, but I just love to do it. I mean. We selling these big, big tails now for around $7. And um, and and that's what I sell them for. And the boat gets like six, six fifty, and uh, they they were probably getting more than that. I talked to a fellow that told me back in the '80s they got eight dollars for twenty-one tails. So. A lot of tough times going on right now. You know, just the, the cost of operation is just so much higher than it used to be for these fellows. Their fuel is just astronomical compared to what it was twenty years ago. Of course, even and, and a lot more than forty years ago. But um. You know, we, we're having fun and we're still trying to sell some seafood. And we find it, the markets are there. People want to buy seafood, but they're so limited. You can only get so much for it. And the cost of operation is really, you know, got the clamps on everybody. cheaper, but uh, the old saying is, you know, you get what you pay for. So I'd rather come to an actual seafood market, you know, that's got a variety of everything, uh, versus a grocery store that might have one or two little items uh, put with their meat. But there's several things, but it's, uh, this, to me, uh, our government is letting so much in, uh, dumping so much stuff, and not regulating. I mean, I really think that the, the, the government should step in and say, look, you know, yes, we're in tough economic times. Yes, we're broke. But for the safety of my people, I'm going to put some more inspectors out there, and we're going to nip this in the bud. I mean, I hate a bunch of regulations, but we got to be regulated to an extent. I, I agree with that. But why let foreign countries not be regulated and us regulated to death? You know what I'm saying? If if they if we got to be regulated, uh, they should be the same thing if they sell the product in the United States. Well, most of that um, 
shrimp from Indonesia and, and China and all is, is cultured in ponds. And the ponds have been used for many years for all kind of fish farming. And so there's all kind of traces of antibiotics, malachite green, which is a treatment to treat ick on fish, which is a banned chemical now, and um, several other chemicals. But they're showing up, and the EU has very tight standards on, on how much, but the United States actually, their standards aren't as tight as the EU. So you can bring a lot of that. That's what really caused the first collapse of the shrimp prices, is the EU turned down shiploads of that stuff. They sent it over here in bulk, and the United States bought it because it was very cheap, and the price hadn't recovered since then. That's not going away. Um, you know, there's, there's just no, no way that the domestic fleet can supply the demand. So you're going to always have that. Um, you're going to just have to try to differentiate your product in any way you can and make people think, uh, you know, I'm willing to pay extra to get just the local fresh product either fresh or frozen, um, because there's no way you're going to ever get rid of imported shrimp, or fish for that matter, everything comes in now. I mean, you can buy, you can buy clams from China now, uh, all packed and frozen in cute little boxes. Uh, so that everything, you've got you've to deal with world markets, I mean, that's just a simple fact. Um, I think imported shrimp has hit us the most. And now, fuel prices is just as bad as the imports. And um, if something don't happen with the fuel prices, you'll see a lot more shrimpers going out of business simply because they just can't do it. You, you, you just can't run a business when you're losing, 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 losing all the time. You can't do it. I guess I said I, I, I'm doing it just to have something to do, <laughs> you, you know. But I love to do it. I love the ocean. That's my life. So, I mean, I sit, up, I sit up here days and don't make a dime. I mean, it's been days I don't make 10 cents. But I'm still here, and I come here every, t every morning with a smile. Rather that smile stay on my face now, but I come here every morning with a smile. I get up out of my bed to go shrimping 2.30, 3 o'clock every morning, like I want to do it. I mean, it's not, oh, I don't feel like it. Nope, if I get up, I'm going. Let's go. We're going to do this. The mission simply is increase production, increase consumption. Yeah. Frank, it was about 97, 98, somewhere in there. I Late call it 95 because I have a chart, and it okay. shows that 95 was our high year. We did $51 million. This is the total uh, seafood production. and. From that 95, which was a good year, which had averaged up to there about $42 million a year, average from 1980 up to 95. 95 was the year that started that sharp decline, and it went down. And starting about 2004 until today, we're doing about 20 million total. Well, I don't know. I, the Department of Ag says that they're going to help us, and uh, if they would get very involved in marketing some of the local stuff to to South Carolina and help us get into some of these bigger local wholesalers. Um, I've heard a lot of rhetoric about it, but I hadn't seen much happen. Because of the way the laws are structured in South Carolina, the seafood, the laws, you know, controlling the, the seafood industry is, we have a lot of misunderstandings because the ag, there are things that the Agriculture Department can do and there are things they can't do because of the way this, this, it's fragmented. It's a fragmented mess. So there are just certain things they can do and certain things they can't do. And the Ag Department has been really good to the shrimpers in this state. They are advertising for them, marketing, and the commission has assigned some people to go to the industrial uh, distributors, Cisco, U.S. Foods, to see if there's anything they can do with the local shrimp. So they are working for us. But I know in the state of Florida, they have a whole office set up to market aquaculture products in the Department of Ag. And it's many people that do it. It's not one or two people. They have a huge budget for it too. 
And if, if they would do something like that with us, it, they might think they were so, so small it's not worth it. But if, if they would do that, then we could grow. I was in Cedar Key and they, they're the largest clam farmers in the United States right now, yesterday. And uh, I went to a guy's place and he had a dozen people working grading clams and selling these little old, tiny clams that I can't even sell. He's selling them in Vegas. And they ship them out there by a plane load. He's air shipping them. And there's several other people selling them in those casinos in Vegas. Well, the Department of Ag got them every one of those markets. They sent people to Vegas, which is a big sacrifice for those salespeople, you know. But because of the way the laws are structured, most of the responsibility is in the Department of Natural Resources, not in the Ag Department. The laws need to be changed, and that's got to, it's going to have to go through the legislature. But you have to change. So like in this creek, instead of we all, everybody used to come in years back and we had our designated docks. They got 99% of your shrimp because you worked so long, the hours when you came in, you didn't have time to go out and hustle your product and get a higher price. The dock price was always fair. But what I want to see, what I would like to see, I don't even know if it's, if it's possible, but to me, if we could turn it over in the state, Whatever, every time it, what do you got? About three or four turnovers there before it gets in the mouth. And that helps everything. Get more tax base, more jobs. But when the imports slammed us, the dock price went to about 50% overnight. So we've all become hybrids. We've all changed. Not much is happening in Colombia for the shrimping industry. Fritz Hollis was our friend. Um, me and my cousin Randy, we was only Republicans. Our parents were Democrats, um, but Fritz Hollis helped us. Our organization, the South Carolina Seafood Alliance, would not exist if it were not for Senator Hollis. We would love to see the people of South Carolina knowledgeable of this. We're working with the legislator now and just started working with them. Well, we've been working with a couple over the last year and now we're moving on to work on more of them to see if we can get a bill passed to change the, the laws around so that the Ag Department is much more involved in, in this food source. This used to be a fuel dock right here. And um, back in, uh, back when, when was the fuel, 74? We was allowed to get 600 gallons of fuel a week here. And I had angels burning about 150, 175 gallons a day. Randy had the same thing, because we was working long hours. We went and seen our uncle, J.C. White, and him and Fritz was like brothers. He made one phone call. The next day, there was so many fuel trucks in here, you could have burned it if you wanted to. Fritz Hollis was a friend of the fisherman. He really was. Not only us, I mean all fishermen. Yeah. He was for the industry. He knew, he knew it was a grassroots industry that started way back. So they're doing what they can for us. And what we need is a change in law. And I wouldn't want to say a paradigm change because it's not that drastic, but we, need, we do need fairly drastic changes in our law structure to put the marketing and just the general business end of it in the agriculture department where it belongs. And times changed and, and you know we're into computers and everything now like you say business is business but this is an old industry and it's slowly it's slowly failed but like I said the imports that's what put us on our back and we've and never recovered. The only Democrat that I've ever voted for and it didn't matter who was running against him I was going to vote for him and I was going to give him campaign money and if he wanted some shrimp to go to Washington, he's going to get Trump. So what do you do when these, these politicians that are running right now, and when they come to you and they, they want to get your support, and I'm sure they do. You want to put your hand over that for a minute? <laughs> I don't know if any does ask us for any, because we don't feel like, like the man said, we don't have any numbers. Right. And politics is all about votes.
Did you have a good day? Not really. No, today we didn't. No. How many cars did you bring out? Today we had maybe uh, something close to 100 pounds with a head on the white shrimp and maybe 150 of the brownies on one drag. And, and that was that was the best drag. It has been the best drag of the day. The first drag on the high water. After that, the low water, um, it falls off. So I had things I had to do today, bring nets to the net shop and whatnot. Did you? I wanted to get in early enough to do that. So. You had a thought. I may, may be going now. No, actually, all that Frank and I have been talking about with you is the industry was extremely prosperous when I got in in the early 70s. It was a good way, a good hard job, but you could really, it was fruitful. You could, uh, satisfaction. You're going in the ocean, working hard, and, and so, you know, you could make a really good living. You look at it. You would never see a wild caught shrimp from China, uh, uh, Indonesia, or Taiwan. You won't see a wild caught shrimp. They won't send us their wild caught shrimp. They're going to send us their junk. We're going to eat their junk and they're going to keep the best for themselves. You take us, we take all our fresh product and send it everywhere else. Back in the old days when my cousin Bubba and myself were young, we we would shrimp till dark. We did we shrimp from midnight till 18 hour stints. But you put your shrimp on the dock. You did not have to sell them. Now we have two jobs. We have to catch them and we have to sell them. shut us down. That's why I'm here. Is that, I mean, I'm not trying to be smart, but that's why I'm here. That's what we do. We watch these government regulations and we go and look and we talk to these committees and say, look, this can't happen. If this happens, this whole industry is done. You're going to put 500, 600 people out of work just because you think we doing this? Show me the facts. Let's see some facts. Get some people out there to study it for 10 years. And by 10 years, it'll be dead. No the legislators, I don't know what they could do. I mean, what can they do? I mean, you know, we have, we've had tens of thousands, probably hundred thousand dollars allotted years ago for the same reason. And I personally didn't see where it helped one bit. Just say you got shrimp for six dollars a pound. It's from here. It was caught yesterday, and they'll say, "Oh, so and so selling it the same size for five dollars." And boy, it's hard to argue with them and tell them so and so selling foreign shrimp. It was caught a month ago, and you're selling them local shrimp that was caught yesterday. And uh, it's hard to deal with. thing with people coming down to the docks are coming down there to buy Bubba shrimp or Wayne shrimp or ham bones and the word gets up this is good shrimp word of mouth I'm saying now the agriculture department could do much more if they were funded for it and if it was written in their it mandated for them to do it. However, it's not. You go buy a pond raised shrimp, let anybody that knows how to cook seafood cook that to the best of their ability and cook a shrimp off one of these local boats to the yeah. best of their ability, and you'll take the pond raised shrimp, and your cat probably wouldn't eat it.